right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Laura, for making me feel super guilty for all the diapers I've thrown away in my lifetime. You're a good, you're a good advertisement for cloth diapering. So sorry I missed that. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, other things that don't see the sun. I guess we can move on with that. Uh, and so I want to start with my acknowledgments and thank uh, Dr. Ibrahim Farag and uh, Dr. Elham Mahmoud Al Baidia. Uh, Elham was a U.S. aid um, fellow in my lab in the past year from Egypt, uh, and so it's been fantastic to work with her on this. And I also have to thank Jacob Williams, who was a REU intern in my lab, who actually did the majority of this work uh, a year ago. So I'm going to talk to you today about the deep subsurface. Uh, and pictured here is the US vessel, which is about to be retired. It's a very sad event. Um, the Joides Resolution. And what the Joides Resolution is able to do is to go out and collect sediments from the deep biosphere. And so when we think about the life we know, of course, um, we are you know, enamored with things like hydrothermal vents and uh, coastal systems, including coral mounds. But uh, we are able to access a lot of the deep biosphere through deep drilling. And one thing that we've always noticed in this deep drilling is that we have about 10 to the ninth cells per um, gram of sediment at the very top. So this would be the very top of the seafloor. And as we go down, uh, MBSF is meters below seafloor. So about 1,000 meters below seafloor. We do see a bit of a steady decline of cells. Uh, and of course, there's arguments for why this happens. Uh, it is an environment which is mostly energy starved and there's very little nutrient input. Uh, so basically the system sets up here as the sediment is created and then changes as you go down core. And just to note, you're heading into the center of the earth here. So typically you have more interactions with geologic processes um, and oftentimes heating up depending on where you are. So today I want to tell you a story about the um, IODP expedition that drilled off the coast of Costa Rica. Uh, and so this dot here, oh, this dot here is where we are. Um, I put in a little diagram here to talk about the plate movement. The reason these sites were drilled was actually to study slow slip earthquakes. So a little bit out of microbial realm to think about, right? But this idea here is that as we have interactions with these plate boundaries, there's uh, possibly signatures of the earthquakes that would come up into the bottom of sediments. And of course, analyzing the rock and the rock type um, let you model what's going to happen in terms of earthquakes better. So today we're going to be looking at sites 1378, 1379. Uh, my lab has published, I think, three or four papers on this already. Um, this data actually has been public for like 12 years. So just a, a side note of like, you can release data and no one else will look at it sometimes. Um, <laughs> so. What actually happened, I think I took these slides out, but what actually happened was uh, Jacob came to my lab for this eight week REU program. He was supposed to be doing this microscopy staining experiment. Two weeks in the microscope broke. Um, since we're at a Marine Institute, there are no other microscopes. So this was a creative way to say, um, as what we were saying, Laura was saying, like, oh, there's a list of intern projects always on my desktop. Uh, and so we shook out our old data and said, hey, Jacob, take a look at this. So. As we started looking at it, we had always ignored the bacterial mags of this environment. Um, actually, we have one paper published on some shallow ones uh, and how they interact with the Hellarchaeota, uh, but we had mostly been archaeal focused on all of this data. So it was interesting is as Jacob looked at this data, he saw that there were, he had about 24 high bacterial mags across different depths. And so over here, it's sort of two meters, 22 meters, 93 meters, and then the other site down to 45 meters. Um, the, there was one, this one that was C unknown, right, had the highest coverage at depth. So if you look at it in the 93 and the 45 meter, um, we saw that it was highest. So actually, are you seeing my mouse? Uh, and so, uh, of course, you know, the intern wonders, did I do something wrong? Uh, and no, actually, this was where the exciting part was. So uh, in that data set, this unknown mag, we had four separate mags that were found, all had their highest coverage at the deepest depths. And just to remember, when we think about sediments, right, there's this decrease of cells with depth. And so it's sort of very counterintuitive to see increases with depth. Um, and so as we look across, uh, we mapped all the reads back to the different data sets, saw that we had extremely high coverage in what is the deepest data set. That's the 93 meters below seafloor data set. So as we looked at the ANI, um, we showed that uh, all the nearby phyla were very different. Our contigs that had um, really good phylogenetic markers were sort of sticking out you know, in the nether space there. 
uh, seem somewhat close to other known, actually, here's your organism again, um, other known phyla, but of course, uh, different enough that we got excited about this. So as we look across ribosomal protein taxonomy, we show that this is potentially a novel phylum. Um, so we're sitting here between the RIF32 and the atri bacteria. Uh, we are going to propose that we would name these things the sideri bacteria. So why would we name them sideri bacteria? Of course, this is all pending acceptance and in my experience would change two weeks after you published it. Um, but we would propose that this be the name uh, sideri bacteria because it's the name from deep sediments and uh, proposed that we would name it Hydrogenotropha williamsi as the genus and species. The Hydrogenotropha, because we do think it's eating hydrogen, the williamsi is Jacob, who found this uh, four weeks into his eight-week RU program as an undergrad. I think he was between his sophomore and junior years at that point. Um, he thought it was really funny you could name something after yourself, so I'm willing to go along with that. Hopefully the reviewers will also accept that. So as we look across the sideri bacteria, what did they do? Um, so Elham and Ibrahim contributed a lot to this metabolic mapping. It seems to do a lot of everything, um, which of course, if you're going to live in a deep sediment, that's a great idea. Of course, has signatures for being a strict anaerobe. Um, we do think that these hydrogenases are very interesting and that they might be uh, sort of uh, fueling the rest of the environment. So as we look across this, um, well, I should say it makes, you know, basically makes most of what it needs also can possibly be doing carbon fixation, which again, if you're going to live in deep sediment is a good thing to do. So if we looked at the metabolic weight analysis of these signatures, particularly at the deepest sample, uh, we saw that all hydrogen metaboli metabolism is likely funneled through this organism. So none of the near neighbors had signatures of hydrogen metabolisms. Um, Elham got very excited about some of these uh, hydrogenases, including a very novel one. Um, one. So one of the hydrogenases sits sort of in the delta bacteria and the firmicutes. Um, the other one is a novel form, uh, which is in the database, it's called an ancient respiratory membrane-bound hydrogenase. Now, granted, when you work in sediments that are million years old, you get really annoyed when other people call things ancient because it's probably from the surface environment. But again, a deep branching lineage of hydrogenase um, is exciting. And so we did some uh, protein modeling to show that we do think the folds are similar. And so we do expect that the function of these genes would be also similar. So what's going on at the deep sediments? So at 93 meters below seafloor, uh, we recovered other mags and looked at what their activities would be. We do think this sideri bacteria phylum is a um, key member in terms of processing the hydrogen in this environment. What is unfortunate is that the um, research done on ship did actually not measure hydrogen. It's, of course, very difficult to measure in a natural sample, particularly when you're bringing a core up from hundreds of meters below seafloor and then to the surface through the water column. You never get an accurate gas measurement. But um, what is exciting is that in this core, there are little snippets of geochemical information that make you uh, associate it with earthquake activity. So it's kind of this, I think, fun idea, right? That the geologic hydrogen development potentially created by mantle interactions is something that might actually be feeding this organism. So we do think that it's sharing um, with the uh, sharing its carbon pool with the rest of the organisms in this environment. There's a lot of processing of C1 compounds. Um, and so it is a typical sort of subsurface environment where carbon and sulfur are sort of doing the most moving, um, but it is uh, potentially a key member of this environment. So of course it raised the question of why haven't we seen this before? So how do sideri bacteria get to depth? If it's most abundant in coverage at 100 meters below depth, of course, where did it come from? We assume it probably transited through the sediment column. And then of course, as most microbes do, bloom when they're happy, right? And of course I'm jaded by my research on Bedgia toa. It's one cell per 10 liters of seawater. So of course that rare biosphere does pop up when it is happy. Um, we do think it is a minor lineage in the sur surficial sediments. The reed coverage is very, very low in the surficial sediments. Um, we downloaded all available data sets that were uh, geochemically somewhat similar, right? So it's not, we didn't spend that much time looking at oxic data sets. We wanted to look at environments where there was a lot of hydrogen and mostly anoxic. It turns out there aren't that many out there. So if you're an environmental researcher, call me if you're going to sequence one. Um, we haven't found it. We don't have a great 16S sequence for it. So of course the database is a little bit lower in terms of how you can look through the metagenomes. 
Um, we're looking for the ribosomal proteins, and again, not finding anything that is within the boundaries that we set uh, to try to find it. So it is very interesting that we pot potentially have a unique phylum um, that even in the other deep sediment data sets we have, we can't find it. And again, those other deep sediment data sets aren't ever near a plate boundary. So it's a bit of a different condition that we're looking at. Um, so uh, in the paper, we're going to propose that this is a subsurface specialist, right? It seems happiest in terms of genomically you know, characterized being more abundant at depth um, and being quite a happy organism as it's trapped in this slowly um, uh, you know, degrading uh, environment. So I just wanted to pitch, since we're talking about novel lineages of life, that the subsurface is a great place to look for novel uh, areas, and this is potentially a novel phylum. Um, why is it such a great place to look? Uh, all of the chemistry, the biology happens slowly, right? We have very low levels of electron acceptors. And so we do think that the less competition allows for some of these more unique lineages to kind of come to fruition, even if um, they may, you know, they're probably existing on the surface somewhere, but we can never see them in abundance. So will we find the Sidaria bacteria elsewhere? We're still on the lookout for it. Um, and again, when we think about a lot of the high hydrogen environments that have been examined, they're actually more shallow, right? And sometimes interacting with oxygen. So it seems like the very special metabolic conditions of this organism haven't necessarily been met in other places. Um, and I would like to actually prove someday that slow slip earthquakes can actually feed this organism, but no one's gonna give me the millions of dollars it takes to get back to the drill ship and spend more time looking at this for this question. Um, so if you know any earthquake specialists, please have them call me. All right, so with that, um, I am happy to end my talk and happy to take any questions. All right, we have time for a few questions. Nobody has one, maybe I'll get started. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yes, okay, so in short, can we show metabolic activity for this group, right? Um, and so I will let you know that what we did with the sample was it uh, came out of the drill core, was sampled, um, sterile as possible, capped and frozen at minus 80. And then it got to our lab, still on dry ice. We took it out, scraped off all the outside of it, took it as it was still frozen and extracted the DNA. Um, so we actually gave it no chance to come back to life in the lab after being frozen. Uh, one of the reasons for that is I'm happy to show you my other papers, which talk about how as soon as you start working with a lot of these sediments, um, you have blooms of other organisms that aren't actually native. So for example, if you take a core and you leave it on the deck of the ship for even two hours, you can actually take an entirely archaeal community that was at depth and overprint it with bacteria, right? And so it's partly just this idea of you let other electron acceptors come in, and if you let you know, heat come in, that basically those conditions change so much. So unfortunately, no, we have not proven it's active. And also, unfortunately, we had very few samples from these depths and um, my collaborator had someone in his freezer and then the freezer went down. And so I don't trust those samples anymore. So we were actually operating in very limited sample space to do follow-up experiments. Um, but of course, that would be a fantastic uh, follow-up experiments. We are typically using genomic techniques like IREP. And now that you mentioned it, I'm not sure we actually did IREP on this. I should double check. Um, and using that as our indicators of actual genomic activity. We have one quick question online from David. Uh, what happens when you give these specialists a surface originated nutrient? Uh, so uh, that's a theoretical question since we have not done that experiment, um, but uh, they seem to be able to process uh, you know, normal sugars, um, normal formate. Again, it would come back to probably the kinetics of, you know, it can process things, um, but it's the kinetics of who's gonna process it first. So again, in a community, it would probably lose out, but going slow, it might win, so. All right, 
I think we're going to move on to the next speaker. Let's thank Jen for a terrific talk. Thank you.